Uh, it is a uh, real pleasure to be with you here, and it was even greater pleasure uh, for me to listen from the audience to some of the wonderful comments being made in the previous session. Uh, for those of you who wonder, these are my two grandchildren. They <laughs> appear on the backdrop of my uh, computer because I don't get to see them that frequently, so this way I get to see them all the time. And uh, they've been on more screens in more places around the world than I think <laughs> any other two kids have been. Uh, that being said, I, uh, I wanted very much to uh, share with you some of the uh, concerns that I think have been raised in the previous sessions and that we saw uh, reflected in yesterday's debate, uh, especially our debate with the uh, Nobel uh, laureates in the evening, which I thought was exceptionally uh, lively and even had personal reminiscences by, by everybody, including myself. Well, uh, without further ado, let me try to cover the challenge of from promises to practice. Uh, I uh, wanted to start out by saying that we have an exceptional time, Peter Singer just said that, but it's also an exceptional time in what is happening in science and technology around the world. And it's an exceptional time for all of a sudden we have uh, three general challenges, there are many others, but I've picked three. One what I call my three Fs, food, feed, and fuel, and that nexus of problems that's arising out of that. The second one is what I call public health and private medicine. And the third is about climate change. And in all three, I think the issues are going to be very severe. There is, however, a revolution in science, and I want to report to you some of the latest and most amazing things I have learned, and then the big challenge of how to move to practice. So without further ado, let us start. I think we are genuinely living the third global revolution. The first was agriculture and sedentarization that moved people from being hunters gatherers, allowed great civilizations to flourish around river basins, whether it be in the Tigris Euphrates here or in China. And to this day, of course, it is the surpluses of the farmers that allow the cities to exist. Without them, there would be no cities. The second global revolution came quite recently, a couple of hundred years ago, and it was, of course, the industrial revolution that transformed the means of production, that established through international trade, and more fundamentally changed the relationship of the human being to the product of their work. People were no longer producing a finished product, they became a laborer part of a machinery of production that is different. The third global revolution is the knowledge revolution. And it's moving that those who have not the, bro the brawn but the brains are the ones who are getting all the wealth and the authority. Those who have and have nots will be those no and no nots. And it is bringing about with it enormous storms inside industry and economy and production as new sectors are being invented, the old sectors disappear and new things are being done. And we are just at the end of the beginning of this revolution. We are barely glimpsing the beginnings of that revolution. Just imagine with all the international capital flows going on, $2.4 trillion a day, would it have been possible without the internet, without computers, without encryption? But if that is the case, looking back 30 years, how can we forecast 30 years ahead where technology will be? The amount of knowledge in some new fields is doubling every 18 months. And the capacity to process huge amounts of information is increasing. But I think societally we are having difficulty coping with the speed of transformation that is taking place. And this is where I look to my friend Peter Singer and others to say, how do we actually think and reflect about this in the future? The cycles between the development of a technology and its adaptation are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And in some cases, like computers, of course, we know that it's about a two to three year cycle. There's a totally new generation of computers available everywhere. Global markets and knowledge-based economy have come about, and that's what the last session was about, the IPRs. And the continents have come together again in a new Gondwana, but at the same time in terms of markets. And these markets are good for private 
goods in, in economic terms, economic definition, but public goods require public intervention. And in fact, some would even say that there are imperfections in the current markets that are reflected in seeing situations such as the frenzied movements on the capital markets around the world and the imperfections that occur that may even blow a fuse on the financial system of the world one of these days. I said at the beginning that, in fact, I was struck by the fact that people call this the information society. And data, when organized, becomes information. When explained, becomes knowledge. And uh, ultimately, I think what we need is to combine that knowledge with reflection, experience, and thoughtfulness to acquire wisdom. The wisdom to be able to deploy the technologies that our minds are able to create, to deploy them in fashions and ways that benefit the entire human family and protect the ecosystems on which we all depend. So wisdom and how we reach it is an important part of looking to the human future. So what are the challenges? Well, clearly, food, the most basic of human rights right now, is being challenged in accessibility and price. And we have heard yesterday Richard Ernst give a rather powerful indictment when saying, surely it cannot be right to burn the food of the poor to drive the cars of the rich. I think that is a, a slogan that is, contains a pithy moment of reflection for all of us. So yes, the three challenges I mentioned at the beginning I will look at, the food, feed, and fuel part. Let us look at that and see what we have. Well, at the food side, we are talking about food security. And food security requires a lot of things. Population is growing everywhere. We expect two and a half billion people more on the planet. We heard from Jeff Sachs yesterday speaking about this. The key question is, can we have affordable food for all people at all times? In sufficient quantities and in sufficient uh, 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 variety and uh, nutrition. And can we do that without destroying our patrimony of the natural environment? without massively trying to expand into lands and forests and destroy everything. So we have to produce differently and not less. And yes, we also have to rely on movements of commodities because the deployment of water and land is not equal around the earth. And remember that when you ship a ton of wheat, it is like shipping 1,200 tons of water. If you ship a ton of rice that is between two and five thousand tons of water. So depending on endowments, we have to find a much fairer, much more open, and much more accessible international global trading system, one that will not discriminate as it does today against this key person, the smallholder farmer in the developing countries, and the kind of complexity that they deal with. Now, food demand, and these are old IFPRI figures, but they already show that the industrial countries that are running the show, that are negotiating, that are subsidizing their, their agriculture, really account for about 15% of the global demand. And that demand is growing in all fields. It comes to fruits and tubers, they are less than 3%. And when it comes to meat products, they are also 15%. But note, please, that this forecast assumes that China will increase because of rising incomes, animal proteins into its diet, but that India, for cultural reasons, will remain very small. Now, if that, for whatever reason, doesn't materialize, then clearly that forecast will have a major additional problem because it's going to require that we address the needs of another billion, 100 million people and increasing. So we need a new doubly green revolution, one with greater genetic diversity, less reliance on chemicals, more interaction with nature, and thinking in an integrated way for soil, water, and nutrient management at the level of the smallholder farmer, recognizing particularly the gender dimension. For certainly, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, this farmer, she is the one who produces 80% of the food, receives 10% of the wages, and owns 1% of the land. And she does that while also taking care of the children. We need to promote alternatives to slash and burn where it still continues to exist. We need to reduce post-harvest losses that frequently can be as much as 30% of the harvest 
is disappearing before it reaches the consumers. We need to increase the nutritional content of the food and to find ways of reducing the burden that women carry in the production of the agricultural product into food. As my guru Swaminathan said, let us always think pro-poor, pro-women and pro-environment. And to do to this task, we who are gathered here today recognize that we must bring the genetic imperative, the new genetics that really combine the traditional wisdom of those who collected the land races and varieties with the modern science that sees beyond the phenotype into the genotype. Different regions will need to address different problems, but all will require the best of science. And I must say I was very happy to see my friend Jeff Sachs finally talk in terms of two tracks. One track, yes, we have technologies that need to be deployed, but we also need to invest today in order to have the technologies of tomorrow. And we need to focus on this by focusing the best of science on the problems of the poor. And here I like to salute Peter Singer, because he and, and ourselves and Eagles later on will talk about that, are really committed to the idea of trying to encourage the rich countries of the world to put 5% of their annual research budget on the problems of the developing countries. Still do it in your northern universities, do it whichever way you want, but focus on the problems of the poor. It will lend a hand not only to the problem, but it will lend a hand to real partnerships. But if that is food, what about feed? Well, according to FAO, we're going to have a substantial increase from 233 million tons at the beginning of the century to over 300 in less than 12 years away. Milk production, egg production, all is going to go up, and feed requirements are going up dramatically. Look where we were in 61 at 400 million tons, and now we're talking about 1,400 million tons of feed requirements. And uh, the notion of the little uh, uh, I have some friends from West Africa here, le poulet bicyclette, these uh, chicken, these uh, wild, wild range chicken are really a disappearing, free range chickens are a disappearing commodity that instead of which this is the production system that now prevails everywhere. And it has, of course, certain advantages, but it has terrible disadvantages also, as we all know from the problems of the treatment of animals on the one hand and on the problems of uh, uh, diseases and disease control on the other. Pigs are an important source of animal protein in China and will remain so, but uh, if we look at beef, there is not enough rangeland to graze cows, and as cows are going to rely on feed increasingly around the world, and as a result, yes, we will have more milk from the cows, but also we need more feed. And the problem is that a beef converts at a 7 to 1 ratio. But it's not just 7 to 1. You have to also factor in that there's a carcass yield. In other words, that the weight of the animal is converted at 7 to 1, but actually what you can eat out of that weight is only 60%. So the factor is even worse. The same is true for pigs. It had a 3 to 1 conversion ratio, but a 60% carcass yield. Chicken, 70%. Eggs have a two-to-one conversion rate, and it takes three liters of milk produced per kilogram of cow feed. So the question is, already we are having a challenge on our food production. Will the grains we produce be consumed directly by humans as food, or will they go to feed and be converted at these ratios I've just described? To which we've added a third problem, fuel. On the plains of America, we have a big question mark being raised today by a policy that sees the utilization of these massive amounts of grains mostly for biofuels. And there's a strong political campaign. And as we heard from Sherry Rowland yesterday, people are in favor of it. It's much easier for you to have an agreed contract with somebody to take your, your grain and turn it into something else. You're dealing with industry. And there's, it's captured the imagination of a lot of people that somehow we would, in the United States, people would become independent of foreign oil. And some are saying, well, let's do it biodiesel, which is certainly much better than, than biocorn ethanol. But it's capturing the public imagination in the United States right now. 
and in other countries of the world. And we need to address how seriously this is being looked at and how environmentally correct it really is because we need science. How green are these biofuels? Well, they're not all the same. And if you look at corn, ethanol, cellulosic grasses, biodiesel from algae, sugarcane in Brazil, other biofuels, they're all very different. And if you look at corn ethanol in the United States, which is the one that has already resulted in the most impact, then the ratio at best, the energy balance is 1 to 1.3. And this is highly contested. This figure is highly contested by many scientists who say it is much closer to 1 to 1, if not even slightly negative in terms of the amount of energy that it takes to produce the energy that you get at the end. So it's not a very efficient conversion rate. On the other hand, if you were to look at cellulosic grasses, and grasses we know, of course, can be harvested as long as you don't destroy the roots, uh, can uh, live on. Ah, there we have a totally different picture. You go from 1 to 2 and maybe up to 36, depending on the production method of the cellulosic grasses. Here we have a conversion ratio that's really promising, and yet, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have as many people defending it. Also, the greenhouse gas emissions is substantially less. It's 91% less for the ethanol produced from cellulosic grasses. Biodiesel from algae is being developed in places like Germany and elsewhere, and this is a promising area because it will tap into the uh, uh, marine environment uh, and a different kind of environment than the one that's competing directly with our foods. And uh, this is a biodiesel lab in Germany, and there at least two and a half to one ratio of input, 68% less. This is uh, the figures available at present, but we expect them to improve. Now, sugarcane in Brazil, which people in the United States frequently refer to, uh, is much more efficient than the corn ethanol, although questions can be raised about the living conditions of the people who have to cut the cane, the sugar cane, and provide that energy. But the bagasse is reused into the, the, the uh, uh, factories that do the fermentation, and the ratio is quite impressive, one to eight. You have a total, and 56% less uh, 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 greenhouse gases. So you can see from one to one or 1.3, 1 to 8. It's a very different ratio. And uh, that sugarcane so far is, of course, the uh, single largest uh, utilization in Brazil, I believe, although my Brazilian colleagues will correct us and there's a special session on that, uh, that it is already uh, over 30% of the current energy use. Other biofuels, people have talked about soya beans being used for that, but at the end of the day, the question is still the same. Are we going to compete with food production or are we going to find other ways of doing it? The sad thing is that the current policies have resulted uh, by putting a six billion subsidy on, on the federal state subsidies uh, 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 on this bioethanol situation. Uh, we have shifted a situation where uh, the amount of acreage available for corn production in the United States has diminished. Corn production for food and f uh, feed has reduced by 20% in one year. Uh, and the, the target of 35 billion gallons of fuel by 2017 would, at present, corn yields require the entire U.S. corn harvest acreage. So you're either going to massively increase the acreage under production or uh, you are going to have to find other ways of doing that. The price of corn rose nearly 80% in 2006, another 80%, and as we saw, we heard the prices have uh, significantly increased by now. It started with riots in Mexico, uh, where much of Mexico is poor. The, the, the staple food for the poor there are tortillas made out of corn, and the corn prices uh, impact was seen with these demonstrations already in 2007. And it is no secret that other food prices have gone up, wheat has gone up, and others have gone up. And the net result of that has been that this problem has been spreading everywhere, in addition to the environmental impact, which is that the most important environmental action we can take today is to reduce the need for more, bringing more land under cultivation. Uh, the more we will expand the land, we will expand into what is referred to as marginal lands, which are 
problematic lenses, we need to know why they are problematic, as my friend Rudy Rabinger says. Do you ask why they are marginal lenses? <laughs> Maybe you need to know more about that. So we need to know that. Secondly, of course, if we expand into forest or other habitats, we are destroying the sources of habitats and biodiversity. So we must harness the best of science to increase the yields of all crops and hopefully also expand the base of crops. It is inconceivable that humanity continues to rely on four basic staple crops, uh, wheat, rice, uh, corn or maize, and potatoes, and the fifth crop being bananas. But, but 12 crops account for 95% of the human diet. I mean, it's an amazing narrow base. We need to expand it. And of course, I see my friends from Icarda here, and they will say, well, barley and sorghum and a lot of other good stuff that they're responsible for should be added to that yield. So if we succeed in bringing science to bear and great, improve the, the yields and the resistance, then we will have safe habitats and biodiversity. But water is becoming a very big problem, and that is insufficiently looked at. Already 65% of global water withdrawals is going to agriculture, and in many developing countries it is 80 to 90%. And this figure is my most stark and scary figure. One calorie equals one liter. If a human being needs five, ten liters of water to drink and cook, and maybe another 15 liters to bathe, and maybe another uh, uh, 50 liters for other activities and whatever, 100 liters per day per person, you need 2,700 liters per day to produce the food you eat. And uh, yes, it varies uh, depending on the composition of the diet and the production system from a low of 980 liters for a 1,460 calorie diet in the pastoralists in the Sahel to a high of 5,500 liters uh, for 3,200 calories in the United States, which has a large beef content in it. But the fact is the average is 2,700 calories, 2,700 liters. And that's your back to one liter per calorie. As a result of that, we've seen the water withdrawals affecting, for example, the Yellow River did not reach the sea for 220 days of the 365 days in 97. Now, that's a disastrous situation. If you were to compare that with Egypt here where we are, the Nile reaches... Cairo, covering with 12 million tons of salts, and by the time it reaches the Mediterranean, it's carrying 34 million tons of salts. So if it did not reach the Mediterranean, if all the water was being withdrawn, all that salt would settle right here in the delta, the one green area that you can see, desert on this side, desert on this side, and can you imagine the enormous problem that would occur if all these lands were not being constantly flushed out by the river. So agriculture is not only a great user of water, but it's also an integral part of managing the water system through the withdrawals and the returns coming in. And already underground water is being used and mined at unsustainable rates, and already 10% of the world grain production depends on mining these aquifers faster than their recharge rate. The key problem with that is that we're subsidizing the energy that is uh, uh, pumping uh, I think, uh, will you agree with me, pumping, there's a lot of energy subsidies in India going towards pumping the underground water to produce the agriculture that is supposedly now going to compete with biofuels back to subsidized energy. So, I mean, we really have to straighten out this mess of interlocking subsidies that are all introducing exactly the wrong policies uh, environmentally across the world. And of course, if we continue to tap this underground water, we will have desertification and the kind of environmental refugees that we can imagine under such circumstances. So, as David Seckler used to say, we need more crop per drop. Every drop of water has to be factored. And the question remains, what are we producing for? Food, feed, or fuel? And can our agriculture, even with the best of science, deal with all three simultaneously. That's a big challenge. Challenge number two, public health and private medicine. There is no question that we have all witnessed a massive improvement in the living conditions of people around the planet. People live longer, healthier lives than they ever did before. But there are enormous disparities. The amount of research that is going into improving drugs, 
frequently the expensive drugs, very sophisticated techniques of analysis and otherwise, surgery, uh, heart transplants, you name it, all sorts of things, laser surgery, precision cauterization, surgeons using, looking at a, through a probe. I like this picture because shows all the surgeons are working, looking at the screen, they're not looking at the patient they're working on because they're working through a probe and uh, uh, providing uh, dental care and orthodontic care. Uh, it is a real uh, uh, a reality service in many places. Uh, but where are we with the fundamental treatments that the poor need around the world? Whether it be vaccines, the availability of treatments that will increase human immunity, deal with the problems we deal, or lifestyle changes. One of the things that is not mentioned and which I find absolutely abominable is that as the rich countries have come country after country to banning smoking, recognizing what smoking does, the tobacco companies which are owned by the rich countries are using the free trade agreements as a way of opening up the markets of the developing countries to tobacco products. And this is being helped by the governments of the rich countries who consider that this is an expansion of free trade. I mean, this is something that is really uh, inadmissible and that we should re reaffirm that we are foisting a product that is going to increase, is a major public health issue in the north. Why are we exporting it to the south in the name of profit for some tobacco companies that really should be put out of business? That is something else. Obesity and That, that sign, incidentally, is all around the library. You all have noticed the library is a no-smoking environment. And, uh, and uh, obesity, diabetes are other things, but we have to cope also with hunger, chronic hunger. And we need to be reminded of the monstrosities that exist in other parts of the world and the need to do something about that because hunger-related causes really impact a lot on the ability of children to withstand the diseases of childhood. Underweight children, etc. These are all campaigns that are being launched all around the world. This is measuring the weights of children. Looking at the scourge of AIDS around the world. Thinking of the link between TB, tuberculosis, and AIDS uh, is an important angle to look at. Malaria, we all know about malaria and uh, the need to, to, to deal with the, the way it uh, uh, really ruins the lives of hundreds of millions of people in all these parts of the world and that this is going to increase only more as the malaria continues to destroy the blood of those individuals. But even old, old enemies are still around. Cholera, there are outbreaks of cholera that occur in different places. This is a cholera clinic in Mozambique. And we are still worried about pandemics. We need to be reminded of pandemics. These are a few images from 1918, the great flu epidemic. These are from the United States in 1918. Look at the way they were converting train stations into hospitals, where everybody walked in the street masked because of the fear that was going on, where public meetings were banned everywhere across the country and where 50 to 100 million people died from a flu. And new diseases are emerging. We talked about SARS and the effective campaigns and we see witnesses again, reminders of the being masked to protect against infection in our cities which are much more dense than they used to be in 1918, almost a century ago. We try to understand better the virus and the biology can do an enormous amount. This is a cover of the Cell Biology 2003. And we're worried about new zoonotic diseases, avian flu converting to humans and the strain that can spread from human to human with uh, a respiratory transfer uh, and, a, and a small incubation period could result into a massive pandemic and for which the healthcare facilities in the developing countries are not ready. Public health in the developing countries is not at the level it should be at the time where private medicine in the rich countries is improving very considerably. Uh, we need to find the diagnostic tests for people. We need to harness the new technologies and the new biologies. And I was very pleased to be with Bill Gates in 2003 when he launched 
the Grand Challenges Program in Davos, along with Elias Zarhouni and others. Then Harold Barmas took that committee to identify that, and I think the Gates Foundation really, with that action, really jump-started the action on uh, looking at health for the poorest of the poor. It is a sad indictment on the governments of the world that are spending $700 billion on armaments that they needed a private individual to jumpstart their concern for the health of their fellow citizens. That the governments of the world could not find the $450 million that Bill Gates put into that grand challenge. The WHO that had identified this a long time ago and had been speaking out for a long time had to await upon the charity of an individual and other individuals rather than the support of its member states. Much more needs to be done for health in the poor countries and I will say no more than that. The third issue is climate change. Climate change is undoubtedly the most serious issue facing humanity today. Sherry Rowland showed you this graph yesterday. It is now undeniable. We can go back thousands of years, 400,000 years ago if you go back. Yes, there is an enormous synchronization between the temperature changes and the CO2 parts per million. As the Justice of the Supreme Court said in his opinion, he recognized that the two were somehow linked. Well, we think there's causality as well. This image, which comes also from the, the uh, uh, famous Oscar-winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, you see the, the glacier in 1928 and in 2004. And yes, we do understand the climate system, even though it is complex. And what we have to do is to recognize that our socioeconomic development path are having effects in terms of em emissions and concentrations and we need to do something about mitigating that effect because once emissions and concentrations are in the air, they do affect climate change. That's we heard yesterday again from Sherwood Roland that it will take a hundred years at least to, uh, for nature to redeem the effects that we did on the ozone layer and so many other things. So we need to do something on that. And with climate change, it has an impact on the human and natural systems, and therefore we have to adapt that and adapt between these two systems. The enormous increase that we can expect in CO2 emissions if no action is taken augurs very poorly for the future. These are some of the estimated impacts on food, water, ecosystem, extreme weather events, and the risk of abrupt and major irreversible changes. Models have predicted more variability in extreme weather conditions, and the data support this. And I think these two diagrams, which are actually come from National Geographic, are extremely nice. This is the number of hurricane tracks, major hurricane tracks uh, for category three to five. Uh, in the 10 years, 85 to 94, you can see Florida here, and there's the Caribbean. Uh, in this part, this United States and this is of course Latin America. These are the tracks coming off the Mediterranean in those 10 years, here's the next 10 years. Those 10 years, the next 10 years. I think nobody can deny that we have had a lot more hurricanes, a lot more uh, extreme weather events. Uh, and people who deny it, I mean, they are, how can you possibly deny uh, these images uh, that are so compelling? And yes, we can even track them from space and watch their images and we can see all too clearly their impact on the ground. The destruction, this is uh, uh, Ivan, Hurricane Ivan, before and after what you see here. This, we worry about the, the, the actions of terrorists who will blow up a building. We should worry also about the actions of our societies that are bringing this kind of destruction onto our lands and our societies, carrying a car all the way and throwing it into a swimming pool. And of course we have seen the devastation in Hurricane Katrina and how New Orleans went underwater, one of the great American cities. This is a beautiful cartoon, I must say. And they're saying, the two climatologists saying, how can we get President Bush interested? And she said, let's call the next hurricane Osama.
And hurricanes are no small matters. I find that if you look at those images from space, you realize the enormous power of these destructive extreme weather events. They are enormously powerful, and they come from the ocean and onto the lands. And yes, we also are concerned about the rising sea level and the melting of the ice caps. But incidentally, this is of course just an artist's rendering of what would happen as Manhattan goes into the sea. But these are real. This is UNEP and Grid Arendal Foundation in Norway making different estimates about what is likely to rise, sea level rise, in centimeters over by 2100. Now, this is the result in Florida of a rise of one meter sea level. And the impact, however, even if it is not felt by lands being submerged, will be felt in agricultural land. Here's Egypt. And we expect, in this case, a 50% increase would push water in here to where you see it. And this would be a one meter rise, a very significant amount. Now, much of this water will actually be stopped. We've learned from our friends, the Dutch, that you can stop these things. But one of the biggest problems that we will have is how this salt water rising with the weight of the salt water will push into the fresh water onto the other side. Remember, a one cubic meter of water weighs a ton. Now imagine half a meter, 50 centimeters rise, multiplied by the size of the sea or the ocean behind it, and see how many tons there are that would be pressing against the fresh water that you are relying on, and how much of that would impact on our agriculture. Already on our coral reefs, those of you who know the coral reefs, and, and certainly those who value the Red Sea as I do, uh, recognize these magical gardens and the enormous biodiversity that they have, which we are barely beginning to know. Uh, it's not just that they're beautiful to see, but they're also potentially very useful. These magical gardens are now being transformed into these dead landscapes. These are real pictures as a result of bleaching. So wiser policies are needed. Biofuels are not the whole answer. Agreement on global actions is needed. And the search for clean, efficient energy will continue. Whether it comes from wind or solar, we need to find ways of harnessing it. Should we revisit nuclear energy? Maybe. This is a compelling uh, view. This is the number of, or the area that you would need to provide all of New York's power by solar, by wind, and by nuclear, at least at present. This is one square mile. This is the map of Manhattan down here. So which one will it be? I don't know. But I think what we need to do is to revisit all the options and think of a wiser policy that can have minimized the impact on the environment. And we also need to address the short-term vulnerability of poor farmers. For most farmers live precariously. And the downside is devastating for them, and climate change is increasing the uncertainty. For us, just like in Hurricane Katrina and the impact on New Orleans, floods are also a problem. This is images in Mozambique, as are droughts. And uh, the variability in sub-Saharan African rainfall is remarkable. And it's seen, for example, this is an average for Kenya. But the real issue is if you take a long view, you will note that this variability tends to have a downward trend. And that downward trend is therefore going to put enormous pressure on those poor farmers who already are living in what we euphemistically call, what we euphemistically refer to as low potential environments. I should just say, in misery. I mean, you, no matter how industrious you are, if you live in this environment out of farming, how can you significantly bootstrap yourself out of poverty? You are locked into a trap of enormous difficulty here. And what is more, that difficulty will increase. And some people say, yes, but you know, uh, some areas are going to improve. And I love this map, incidentally, which shows the green are the areas that will improve. And the white, the, 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 the yellow, red, and black are the ones where it's going to get worse. So people who say it is offset by gains, well, the gains are extremely few compared to the devastation that will happen. This is the length of the growing period that will be available, and we will lose as much as 50 days a year, possibly 50 to 100 days in some areas. 
So we need a strategic approach with public education, behavioral change, addressing priorities, immediate improvements, and dealing with mitigation as well as with major change. These are the three challenges. But the revolution in science is taking us in totally new directions. And I will say, this is a slide that I got from Gabrielle personally in the mid-90s. And I used to use it a lot to show where are we going in the future. And uh, I used to say we are going to assemble uh, genomes like Lego sets sometime in the future. Uh, well, uh, what is it going to be used for? And this was a cartoon which I got from my friend Rob Horsch and it said American farmers are going to increase their product. They haven't quite reached that and biofuels is eating into that right now. But this is not a cartoon. This is for real. That's a cucumber. This is a cartoon, real. Cartoon, real. See, things are really happening over there that's quite dramatic. But why aren't we addressing the problems of the poor? Well, it turns out that this issue of assembling genomes like Lego sets is didn't even have to wait till 2010, the first of the barriers on the graph. By June 2007, uh, the uh, Craig Venter and the Venter Institute had recorded a patent, both in the United States and in WIPO, 100 countries, that is claiming, in fact, the creation of a synthetic organism. We'll come back to that in a moment. But we have seen the utilization of biotechnology for example, in golden rice, edible vaccines, better nutrition. So there's a lot of things that can be done. And this, for those of you who haven't seen this before, it's one of my favorite slides. These are two pigs. Uh, they are twins. They have nothing to do with pigs. They are twins. One was fed on regular corn. The other was fed on quality protein maize. So you can see the difference between the two. So nutritional content is also an area where science can do a lot to provide longer and more productive lives. But what about this new synthetic biology? Well, some people, like in the Venter Institute, Craig is looking at ways of transforming bacteria and working. Now, Venter, as you know, he, he and Claire Fraser were the founders of Tiger, and later on he worked with the, in competing for the, the uh, crack in the human genome. He works closely with Hamilton Smith, a very distinguished Nobel laureate, on these issues. And in that case, what he patented, which... Uh, is a form of bacteria that is completely assembled in the, in the laboratory. It's a platform on which he wants to transform the bacteria into biofuels that would be uh, clean burning, would be uh, transferable by, by, uh, by uh, pipes immediately, and could be available in a relatively short time. These are the actual patent numbers that have been filed, so we know that. In parallel, George Church, in the, in, at Harvard, uh, I invited him to come, but uh, he couldn't make it this time. I hope he comes another time. Very interesting scientist. He is. He told me in January when I was with him that he is on track to do a complete cell uh, by 2009. So I don't know what his cell will look like, but uh, is it going to be E. coli or something else? But uh, he was one of, uh, of ten people that Kofi Annan called along with me and others uh, uh, in his last days as Secretary General to discuss what should be done about biotechnology. But with that new synthetic biology coming on stream, we have serious questions both of ethics and deployment of technology on the one hand, but also of promise of new techniques and technologies coming on stream from a totally different angle from the conventional ones that we've been talking about. I call them conventional by now. The new biology has become conventional and mainstream. We're talking about totally new ideas in the synthetic biology. And let me give you a chance to look at something. Now, of course, we all know the brain-mind distinction and in a lot of that. This is a brain, and we got to know a lot about brains recently and we identify different parts of the brain. We use uh, computers to see them in different lights, X-rays, MRIs, NMR, PET scans, etc. We identify a damaged brain, as you can see here. Actually, a brain function in real time. This is a brain watching images, the red neurons firing, and listening to music, the blue neurons firing. So we can even see the functioning of the brain now can be witnessed. We've identified the parts where the legs, the trunk, the arm, the hand, the fingers, which parts are being used by what in the primary motor cortex that we see. And we know the connection between the eyes and the ears and the, the, the uh, brain. And uh, we know that there are switching pathways. And just as we see these trains being switched, 
we ask ourselves what can happen on neuronal networks. The cochlear implants show that you can, unlike regular hearing aids, we're not just magnifying the sound, we're connecting directly into the nervous system. So there is something there. And you suppose you all remember the Terminator. The question is, can a cyborg really exist? Well, uh, Rubinsky and Juan in Berkeley 2000 showed the first connection between living cells and electrodes. And immediately thereafter in 2001, in the neurological labs at Duke, Miguel Nicolelis and the brain machine interface he did with Bell, the rhesus monkey, with her robotic arm. He implanted a neurochip in the brain of the rhesus monkey, which was able to read the, the electrical signals of the neurons. And to, when the monkey thought about moving her arm, a robotic arm would move, first in the lab and then at MIT, 600 miles or 1,000 kilometers away. And that is Bell and her robotic arm. And the purpose of that, who benefits by this, would be trauma victims who uh, could be perhaps their brain was functioning, but they're unable to move or to speak. They could, by a non-intrusive uh, uh, chip uh, through a helmet sort of thing, be able, in fact, to command a chair and the robot. But Nicolelis went way beyond the robotic arm, and this January he published the results of this amazing experiment. The monkeys walk, as you can see here, upright, bipedally. And therefore, in the United States, they put a monkey on a treadmill, as you can see here, and the monkey's brain, actually later on had a helmet, uh, sent a signal that in Japan, halfway around the planet, controlled a robot walking upright as well. It was the brain waves of the monkey that was controlling the robot halfway around the world. And there's the experiment, and there is uh, Dr. Gordon Cheng in Japan, and uh, uh, Dr. Nicolelis in the United States. This is January 2008, literally halfway around the planet. But even more important and more striking is that they put cameras in the eyes of the robot, put obstacles in Japan, and put a screen in front of the monkey. And the monkey was able, with biofeedback, to move. It started, and they stopped the treadmill, so the monkey started moving in accordance with the obstacles that were put in Japan. And by his brain waves, controlled the robots who actually moved through the uh, uh, obstacles in Japan. And that is the explanation of the biofeedback mechanism that was used. And he is being seated with the original experiment that you can see. Now, could this be done to help impaired humans? Probably, at some point in the not too distant future, given the speed with which we went from the, the first electrode with human cells in 2000. Here we are in 2008, having this kind of interface halfway around the planet. So we need to think about what can be done with this kind of thing. Now, Peter and other ethicists here will share my concern about this side of the experiment. That experiment, which was done at the uh, 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 State University of New York, is Roborat. That was actually funded by DARPA which is the Defense Advanced Research Project uh, Agency. And what they did here was the opposite. They are not reading the brain waves of the rat. They are feeding information into the brain waves of the rat. To uh, Sanjeev Talwar and his team, they, they produced a rat where they could, in fact, force him to turn left or right and send a pleasure signal so that the rat thinks that he is making the decisions and is enjoying it. And uh, they do that by tickling the whiskers. And this is the experiment explaining it. And they say it's a radical innovation for remote rescue. But they were able to get the rat to go up, down, stairs, through a doorway, up in the finish, and so on. Now, for some of us, we start wondering, is this the beginning of Orwellian mind control, where we will be uh, implanted with nanobots that we know nothing about and feel happy making decisions which uh, somehow somebody is feeding us uh, pleasure signals? I don't know, but it does say and it does remind us that ethics 
The deployment of new technologies raises ethical questions, and we need bioethical concerns, and we need discussions in society to do this. To move from practice, we have to ensure that all this science doesn't lead simply to giving those who have a lot, they have a lot more. As you know, the rich countries are 40 times richer than the poor, but they spend 220 times as much on research, and this significant inequality is reflected in the digital divide. You see here a preschool in Germany and a school in sub-Saharan Africa. Preschool in Germany, school in sub-Saharan Africa. No blackboard, no walls, no ceiling, no nothing. Will the $100 computer be able to overcome that? I sincerely hope so. Or at least it's putting a downward pressure on prices and that will help. But what we do have today around the world is that this is a modern agricultural research lab and this is a rice farmer in Asia 2,000 years ago and a rice farmer today. 2,000 years ago, today. And this is going to lead us in this century into a form of scientific apartheid unless we find a way of harnessing the science differently for the future. And this can be done even for Africa. We had the Inter-Academy Council report, which I had the honor to, to co-chair with Jacob Paris. We presented it to all the, the decision makers of the world at the UN on behalf of the scientists of the world. And we recognized the need to look at the policy for science, on human resources, on institutions, on the public and private domain, and only then to worry about financing. And our young people, our young people need financing, for they are important, but that's at the end. And in the advanced countries, you have the resources to do that through venture capitalists, who will invest pennies to reap fortunes at a later stage. And I look at this picture, and I say, this group of young people, who are they? They are Microsoft Corporation in 1978, and this is Bill Gates down here. And the question is, would you have invested if a bunch of kids like that came to you and said, we have a wonderful idea about something called Windows that's going to change the world? Would you have invested? Would our people have invested? Would the rich who have so much money in the Arab world today be willing to invest in our young people with their ideas the same way that there were people willing to invest in these young people with their ideas. That is a challenge for all of us. We believe that our young people are no less able than their young people. We just need the opportunity. I had the honor also with Kalesos Juma to, to chair the African Biotechnology Panel with many distinguished Africans, and Poko Bukanga is here with us today, and many others have been with us here before. And we really said that it is absolutely essential that Africa make full use of biotechnology. That it cannot be done for all of Africa as one entity. And I need to remind the audience of just how big, just how big Africa is. Look at this image. You could fit the United States, Europe, and China inside Africa. U.S. including Alaska. Europe and China all fit in Africa. It's huge. Africa is huge. But at the same time, it cannot be done for 53 small African countries. So we need to work in regional cooperation. And we identified five regions where we could work. And we need to have a priority areas, critical capabilities, harmonize the regulatory measures, but move the regulatory measures in a co-evolutionary approach. You need the scientists to work who will run the, 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 the controls and, and, and the safety as well as do the research. There is no point in putting traffic lights and, and uh, speed limits if you have neither streets nor cars. You need to have to pave the streets, have the cars, and also do that together. So all the parts of these recommendations are essential. They reinforce each other. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. But to design that, we need to understand what is happening and why. And here's where we come in. At the Library of Alexandria, and I have a whole team of people here who will have a special session on the science super course, we're trying to make this best and science, the latest research of science, available in easily used lectures and PowerPoints. We started a few years ago with this slide with a thousand lectures which we were giving away, and then now we moved on. We have over 31,000 participating teachers, 150 countries, 2,600 lectures, 75 million hits, and we produced that particular super course uh, and distributed it. But now, in this BioVision, we're distributing this one with over 43,000 
teachers participating in 175 countries with 3,400 lectures reaching over a million students every year. This is done for free. It is a gift to be given. You all have a copy of it. Please share it with people. The intention is the contrary of IPR. We want science to be accessible to all young people in all high schools, in all colleges, everywhere in the world for free. The super course gets over 80 million hits, of which 8 million are here in the Library of Alexandria. And actually, we're interested that from the Russian Federation because of Jean, who also translates things into Russian, and the United States because of Ron Laporte and Faina, we get a lot of hits here. The next, of course, will be to turn from what is now a health into a major uh, all science uh, course and uh, both uh, Ron Laporte and myself are teaming up with Vince Cerf and Gil Omen to really make this work. The new Library of Alexandria is really focused on servicing with a, that's the last thing I will say, a third kind of science and I hope you will take the time to visit and see the quality of science being done. Until 10 years ago there were only two kinds of science. There was theoretical science and experimental science. Now we have in silico simulation by computers. Increasingly it has certain advantages, of course. There's not quite an oops button on the computer, but pretty much if you make a mistake on your computer experiment, it's not the end of the world. But what we have at the library is therefore we provide the computer infrastructure for science. A hybrid library with over 25,000 journals, which is accessible from everywhere. Large computing capability, our supercomputer is being installed an analytical center with a virtual reality immersive uh, 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 technology and science applications which you should visit the VISTA where you can actually manipulate and step inside what is called a cave structure but where you can actually step inside molecules, look at buildings, simulate uh, 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 medical conditions and even visit distant buildings. Uh, analyze things in ways that can be discussed with groups of people. We have large storage devices. This is the Internet Archive which is every single publicly accessible page on the web is photographed six times a year. It's an enormous amount of information. It's available in San Francisco. We have the only copy in the world here. And what is important is that not only do our young people here maintain that, they also install it and they also assemble it. Just to tell you how big that is, one rack, one of these racks, if you took a book of 300 pages, and converted it into text. One rack would carry a hundred million books. And if you had books with pictures and color, it would carry 12 million books. And these are being assembled here in Egypt and installed by our young people. And finally, we still need large bandwidth connectivity to work directly with the rest of the scientific establishment, especially with the new techniques that are coming. So we are trying to join with Géon 2 that will link us with the rest of the world. With this facility, the BA would be proud to contribute both through the super course and through that facility to reviving excellence in science in Egypt. And it's only if we build that capacity that science will fulfill its promise to feed the hungry, to heal the sick, to protect the environment, to bring dignity to work, to create the space for the joy of self-expression, and science by itself is not enough. Remember, we need the wisdom to do that. So we need to build the capacity in the south. It is not a luxury, it's essential. It's an absolute necessity. We've had many past declarations, but we have to remember that rhetoric and declarations are not equal to action. And this cartoon by my friend Zapiro of South Africa says that in this conference of African, from French to English, English to Swahili, when it comes to rhetoric into action, we're still missing a key translator, says he. And Abdullah Dar and myself and Bogogo know this about the African Union meeting for our biotechnology report. But if we build the capacity, science will fulfill its promise. Time is running out. Let's work with nature, not against it. Let's collaborate for a better future for the next generation and for the whole world. Thank you.